Hi, my name is John Weber with Schneider Electric, and today we're going to be talking about adding a battery based system to an existing grid tie PV system. This is the second part of our webinar series on this subject, so please, if you haven't seen the first one, definitely check it out. We kind of talk in general terms about sizing um, and some of the other battery based solutions that we can provide. But we're really going to go into kind of the how to do it now instead of the theory, which is what was covered in part one. So please join us and uh, we look forward to uh, going through this webinar with you. As an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, of course, we need to take system considerations into account, which is really talking about um, what is the right system for the location. And then, of course, once we've made that decision, we need to talk about how to plan and make sure that we cover um, single phase loads, uh, split phase loads, and we'll even talk about some three phase loads. With the install, we'll go into those balance of systems that you're going to need to bring that solution together. How easy it is to bring the uh, Schneider Electric XW Plus or Connect SW and put it up on the wall. Finally, of course, once it's up on the wall, we'll get into some programming and how to set that system up to make sure that uh, we don't do anything uh, that could result in some harm to either the system or the batteries. And of course, after all of that, we want to make sure that that systems running properly and Schneider Electric Pro offers several different ways of doing the monitoring. So let's start off first with the system considerations and get into exactly what is the right location and place for a PV install uh, with battery retrofit uh, done to that system. We'll talk about three different ways of doing it along with some system sizing and again some three phase and just make sure that uh, everything that we need to have uh, we have on hand before beginning an install. When we think about what we need to do to bring a solution together, there's really kind of three different approaches that we can take to bringing uh, a battery-based solution into an existing PV uh, solution. First, of course, is battery backup. And what we mean by that is uh, we're not going to be charging or interfacing at all with the existing PV system, but just simply bringing in, say, a Connect SW, along with some energy storage, identify those loads that we need. And um, the primary charging source is, of course, going to be from uh, an, a qualified AC source, either being the grid or the generator. With AC coupling, that is where we're talking about actually creating a qualified AC source for the PV inverters to initiate uh, when the grid is not there. And then with DC coupling, that's simply talking about taking out a PV inverter and actually replacing it with something like our MPPT-80 charge controller. Very typically, um, with today's PV inverters, we're looking at somewhere between 300 and 600 volts uh, within a string. And so that makes a really nice and ideal solution for simply pulling that inverter out and placing that MPPT-80 charge controller into that solution and going with a complete DC coupling. And there's some great advantages uh, to doing that as well, and that's what we've covered a little bit in part one. So for an existing PV solution, what is the right amount of, of batteries, inverter, and everything else? When we talk about sizing, we really do recommend doing 100 amp hours per kilowatt hour of PV inverter power. And the reason we, that we say that is just simply because we can't always guarantee that the amount of PV that is being produced is not going to be consumed by loads. So let's imagine we don't have any loads in the system. What's going to happen if all of that current's going into the batteries. And batteries, and if you talk to the battery manufacturer, they will always tell you that there is a maximum charging uh, to those batteries. Anything above that, um, interestingly, is probably going to undercharge uh, those batteries. And so, at 600 amp hours for a 6kW PV inverter, that's just an example of that kind of one-to-one -one ratio uh, that we're looking for. For the inverter, of course, again, we need to make sure that we aren't putting such a large PV array onto that system. Even if we've chosen a very large battery bank, what can happen is that the inverter is rated at, say, 6.8 kW. If you had 8 kW pushing through that, that inverter would eventually uh, self-protect because it would get too hot. So we need to make sure that we're doing um, the calculations to ensure that we aren't accidentally overheating that inverter. And please take ambient temperature into account as well. For maximum depth of the discharge, this is a very interesting topic, um, something that I've uh, been advocating for, which is that um, if it is a grid tie PV inverter system uh, with battery backup, your maximum depth of discharge can actually be greater than that typical 50%. And the reason I say that is, is we're typically just going to be connected to the grid. 
And if we're just connected to the grid, then that means that 99% of the time, maybe even just 98% of the time, that battery system is going to be sitting in float day after day after day. So sizing can be done a little bit different based on the behavior of the system or the needs for that uh, solution. So if they're only losing power a couple times a year and we're only going to get 300 cycles out of batteries at say 90% depth of discharge, we can actually size that system out because you figure out that that's 15 years worth of backup storage in a float situation. Um, and so matching that cycle life to the known number of power outages we're expecting is a great way to keep that overall system um, less expensive essentially. For charge current, again, we just need to make sure that we aren't pushing too much current onto that system uh, when we are uh, AC coupled. Because it is an uncontrolled charge, we're pushing power onto those batteries. If we have too much current going there, that can cause harm to those batteries and very likely um, create a warranty issue that will not be covered by the battery manufacturer. A lot of questions about energy storage uh, when it pertains to all the options for advanced storage. We'll be covering that in a different webinar and just taking some of those ideas into account. So uh, keep your ear to the ground for that and uh, please join us for uh, a webinar later on this year for advanced storage. For load assessment, this is probably one of the most important practices that we can do uh, when we're designing a system. And really with load assessment, there's different types of loads that we need to be aware of. One of course is the inductive loads, which has that surge rating or lock rotor amps that we need to make sure that we take into account. Uh, you know, it may be uh, that it's a normally a thousand watt load, but it could have a 5,000 watt uh, lock rotor amp rating surge uh, that we have to make sure that the inverter can cover along with normal resistive loads, which are toasters, um, light bulbs, um, and even some you know LCD TVs, just the common loads inside the home that don't have a motor inside of them. Things to definitely be aware of, of course, fridge, freezers, um, uh, well pumps and things like that all have a, an electric motor inside. And so we need to make sure that uh, we take their ratings into account when we're sizing the system. The nice thing is, is with the Schneider Electric product line, of course, uh, we have a very nice surge rating on all of our inverters. So just do those calculations. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, products out there that can help you understand and design for uh, your inverters as well as uh, battery banks. This one was just a quick search that I did uh, through WordPress. So uh, definitely take some time to do these calculations and and uh, make sure that you understand exactly those loads so that we don't run into an issue where uh, the inverter is shutting down uh, because the loads are too high. So now that we have the, the loads figured out as well as what the inverters that we're going to be using, we need to make sure that we understand exactly how the system works and where all the little parts go. When we talk about the circuits to be placed on a critical load panel, those are the loads that typically go uh, on the output of the inverter, and those loads are powered by the inverter uh, during a power outage or in pass-through from the grid uh, during normal uh, operation of the system when the grid is there. Of course, we need to make sure that we're identifying uh, single phase 120 and single phase 240 uh, circuits inside the system, and that we're balancing both legs uh, so that typical loads, uh, especially for the the 120 volt range uh, are paralleled um, properly between the two um, the legs. For the 240 loads, of course, we need to make sure that, again, those typically bent tend to be those larger loads. And uh, we talked about system sizing in the last slide. Again, make sure that we understand what those uh, very load, large loads are. Of course, any time that we start working on a system, uh, we become responsible for that system. So making sure that we look through the system and, uh, you know, when you're doing a walkthrough and doing a bid on a system, especially note those things that are maybe falling into compliances from, gosh, 2005, 2008, maybe even earlier than that. And some of those things may require uh, updates to those. Uh, of course, the inverters themselves, uh, the neutral to ground bond, if the system is uh, connected to a main panel, there's going to be that neutral to ground bond inside of there. Make sure that we don't have any extra neutral to ground bonds. There is only one in the system, um, and so that's important to note. As well as arc fault uh, or combined arc fault interrupts, uh, that's something that's new for NEC 2014. A lot of states trying, starting to uh, recognize that uh, NEC code listings, and so uh, we need to make sure that anywhere we get near um, 
those arc faults, we have to have that detection uh, in place. For batteries, of course, we have to make sure that we are making the space for them. Especially with uh, flooded batteries, you need to make sure that uh, we have it somewhere where we can actively vent uh, or passively vent, depending on the style of box that's built around those flooded batteries. For AGM and gels, those can be... Um, an either or you can run into a jurisdiction that's going to require you to have some sort of venting uh, around those or it could be that uh, there's the free air so definitely work with the battery manufacturer and understand uh, materials data sheet can definitely help uh, make the argument about why uh, you may not need that active venting. Of course, is it advanced storage? Uh, really hard to say because there's a lot of different options out there. So just make sure that uh, you understand what those needs are for the storage technology that you're choosing. Because we are going to be talking about monitoring and bringing that system together uh, so we can see it both locally as well as remotely, uh, communications is definitely part of the um, the needs for the system. So how far is the router? Can we use a Wi-Fi adapter to uh, plug into, say, the comm box to get that boosted signal out to the, um, the router and then onto the web so that we can use something like uh, Insight? So definitely keep an eye on if the system's going to be remotely based in another building. Um, can you get a Wi-Fi signal out there so that you can do that communications? Some other considerations, of course, uh, the outdoor disconnect for the AC box um, is really to make sure that we uh, have a way of shutting the system down externally. Uh, you know, typically firefighters uh, will disconnect from the mains uh, so that uh, we kill the house power, but uh, because we have a battery-based system inside of there, make sure that it's well labeled on the outside of the uh, system so that uh, when somebody approaches the structure, they understand that there's very likely still AC power inside that house and they have a way of shutting that down. And finally, if there's feed-in tariffs uh, with the battery-based system, of course, we have a critical load panel and those loads are consuming power during the normal daytime. And we talked about that with AC coupling, um, power is normally just going on out to the grid and you have your revenue grade meter there. But if you have... Uh, those loads on the critical load panel, they're actually pulling power off of there and you may not get uh, your feed-in tariff for it. So definitely make sure that you have a bi-directional revenue grade meter on that system because AC coupling, of course, is going to put power first onto uh, the critical load panel, then pass out through that load panel on into the main panel and then out to the grid. So making sure that we have the right number of meters there. We'll make sure that uh, we aren't affecting the total um, return on investment, if you will, for that system uh, by not producing as many credits as we were before. Three-phase backup loads may be somewhat uncommon, but aren't necessarily uncommon when we get to uh, commercial sites, uh, light industrial, and sometimes even some very, very large homes. Uh, something to note about doing a three-phase system, of course, is that each individual inverter is really managing um, a single phase. And so we need to make sure that when we are uh, putting loads on the output of those inverters, that we're balancing those 120 loads uh, across all three inverters and not just stacking up uh, a lot of the single phase loads onto one of the inverters. What's going to happen is, is that especially if we have a surge, those inverters are going to respond. But if one is also taking care of a lot of smaller loads, the single phase loads, then we may be overwhelming the that one inverter. So we really need to make sure that we're distributing those single phase loads, the 120 loads, across all three inverters. The other thing to note, of course, is that uh, for proper stacking with the XW Plus, it is a Y configuration. So if you have a delta coming in, you need a delta to Y transformer to manage that. The other thing to note, of course, is that when we have more than one inverter stack, so let's say we had six inverters, is that the transfer rating on the uh, XW Plus is about 48 amps with the D rate. Um, and so nominally, that's 28 amps per phase. If we were to put two of those uh, inverters on the same phase, then we have to start looking at a three-phase uh, transfer switch to manage it because uh, we're going to either prematurely wear out the relays inside or possibly weld them if it uh, occurs during a surge. So something definitely to be aware of uh, throughout that system. Uh, with that external transfer switch, of course, we're going to lose that transfer time. Uh, if you look at the um, 
the transfer rate. It's in a few milliseconds uh, for the XW+. Plus. When we add a transfer switch, of course, that's going to become much, much longer. So there could actually be a true uh, momentary blackout within the system as that transfer relay occurs. So definitely check out the manufacturer for the transfer relay and understand that that is going to be a determining factor on how fast the inverter switches from uh, an, a now unqualified AC source to a backup mode uh, where it's going to be providing the power because it could be that you're expecting for nothing to reset, all the computers to work, uh, the lights not to flicker at all. Um, but with a transfer switch, of course, that's going to increase that delay and could cause some issues. We mentioned earlier and talking about uh, DC coupling as a way of replacing that PV inverter and going with a DC coupled system. Really, the MPPT-80 uh, makes the most sense. Of course, if we have a central or a grid tie inverter inside of a solution a home or whatnot, typically, you know, there's strong 300 to uh, 500 volts. And so we can easily bring in that MPPT-80 uh, charge controller as a single string. So we're just simply removing uh, that PV inverter and using those conductors to do the MPPT-80. The advantage of that is that we can then start using some of the um, advanced features within the Connext SW or the Connext XW+, Plus, including uh, time of use and self-consumption. With AC coupling, of course, the inverter is in pass-through mode. Um, we don't have that option to be able to do these um, advanced features because we really don't have a way of charging those batteries uh, from the PV source. Instead, we're charging it from the AC side of the inverter. So um, DC coupling does definitely make a lot of sense if you foresee that maybe the jurisdictions where these systems are going to be going in is becoming less friendly. And AC coupling, um, of course, is going to try to sell that power back uh, all the time. And with a DC coupled solution, we can now manage how that system's being used. We can leverage the energy storage uh, within that solution, even if the sun isn't uh, at peak periods, we can still inject current from the energy storage to help us do things like time of use and uh, that self-consumption. So we, again, need to make sure that we're not putting too much PV onto a single MPPT-80 charge controller. Very typically with a 48 volt system, of course, we're talking about a maximum of around 4,800 watts uh, of PV. Uh, one thing that's going to uh, plateau that um, that graph, we look at the system, you know, we should see a bell curve, but if we put too much PV on there, we may see that the system is actually curtailing itself uh, because the MPPT-80 uh, can only um, produce 80 amps at one time. Of course, with a 24 volt system, if you're going to be using the Connext SW, um, it's about half of that. So with planning, let's go ahead and get into exactly what you need to make sure that that system is going to go in correctly. Um, do we have the, the square footage? Do we have um, where everything's going to go? Have we identified uh, during the walkthrough of the home those circuits that are going to be affected and, and things that we're going to have to update from you know, NEC 2005 up to NEC uh, 2011? Some of the most basic things that we're going to need for an install, of course, is to make sure that we know exactly where those batteries are going to go. And we spoke about earlier making sure that the venting is proper if we're going to be using flooded batteries, checking if uh, gel or AGMs need anything um, according to the local jurisdiction. Uh, for advanced battery storage, of course, we need to check to make sure that there's no restrictions there as well. For an indoor location, which all of our equipment is uh, indoor rated, both the uh, inverters as well as the solar charge controllers, we need to make sure that uh, we're looking at the GFCIs uh, for the water rooms if we're going to be updating or backing those up. Again, that goes back to that idea um, is if the house is old enough and hasn't had that done, those are some of the things that should be done um, and may need to be done before uh, that system gets certified. Of course, we need to make sure that we're not doing any multi-wire branch circuits. We, what we mean by that is that if we have a split phase 120-240 dual pole breaker system, uh, we can't just move one of those. We have to move both of them because they're sharing that neutral. Um, so just something to be aware of. Of course, when we go to hang the system, we need to make sure that we understand exactly uh, how much space it's going to take up, not just the inverter, but as well as the balance of systems, um, both with the the load panel or the critical load panel, as well as um, just the general balance of systems um, for both the DC wiring as well as the AC wiring. If you do have a generator, and this is something that 
that I discovered uh, during my research uh, on a previous webinar is that we need to make sure that the generator uh, covers the warranty if it's going to be charging batteries. I did find uh, a couple of generator manufacturers who very clearly stated within the warranty that this generator is not rated to charge batteries and uh, that will invalidate the warranty. So definitely check if you have an existing generator there that we're covering those, um, those warranty needs for the generator itself. Um, for the main breaker size, of course, we need to make sure that we have the room for those dual pole 60 amp breakers, uh, both for the Connext XW as well as the uh, Connext SW for its bypass. And then finally, uh, when we look at what the sub panel is, if we are going to be using a PV inverter, you uh, definitely need to make sure that we have a correct rated panel so that we can backfeed onto that main panel um, with the uh, correct amount of current. So it could be that it's a 100 amp panel. It could be that it's a 200 amp panel, just depending on the size of the PV inverter and how much PV you're back um, feeding onto that critical load panel. So things definitely to be aware of uh, when you're going to do the install is that especially with AC coupling, there's a few extra things to be aware of uh, when putting that system together. There are a lot of different PV inverters uh, currently out on the market. And one of the things that we need to check with uh, when we're doing AC coupling is whether or not this is a curtailing or non-curtailing inverter. There are a lot of different options out there. SMA, Schneider Electric, both make curtailing inverters, meaning that um, we're able to vary the frequency output from the XW Plus or the Connext SW um, as it relates to the battery voltage. And as the batteries charge, the frequency will begin to shift and those inverters will actually reduce the amount of current that they're injecting into that AC source. For non-curtailing inverters, and there's a lot of them out there, um, and there may be some that have traditionally been uh, non-curtailing inverters, but the manufacturer has actually updated firmware and has allowed uh, a firmware update so that you can create a curtailing inverter, which of course uh, is always recommended because you can do that correct charging. But in general, with non-curtailing inverters, um, it looks for that at qualified source. So what's going to happen is, is that as the batteries fill, the XW plus or the Connext SW is actually going to do a frequency shifting up to 60.5 Hertz. And at that point, that then, according to UL 1541, is actually going to become a non-qualified source. And so the non-curtailing inverter is just going to simply stop producing current. And so at that point, the batteries will come back down to a resting voltage, 300 second count, and then um, it will begin requalifying that source once the batteries have fallen down um, below that 60.5 hertz. So it definitely does work, but there are some things to note about that. In particular, it's a full current output. So if the batteries um, are basically completely full, um, that PV inverter is going to come on and off many times during the day uh, just simply because it's putting its full current output um, very soon after it becomes a qualified, qualified source. Uh, it's definitely going to start putting that out. Um, so it's going to kind of hit the batteries and then let go. Hit the batteries and let go. Uh, we always recommend, again, a curtailing inverter is best, um, but definitely, definitely works with the non-curtailing inverters. So let's begin looking at what the size of the needs are for clearance with, uh, in this example, the XW Plus with the power distribution panel. We can see here that uh, it's about 36 inches wide and uh, it can be quite tall. So we need to take into account that the XW Plus actually pulls air in from the bottom and pushes it out through the top. So at minimum, we need to have a six inch clearance from the ceiling so that the inverter can push the air out and keep itself cool. With the Connex SW, we recommend, and this is going to be out to the right hand side of the uh, Connex SW, that we give it about 10 inches. The really nice thing about all this uh, equipment is that um, with the brackets, we can actually hang the inverter up on those brackets very, very easily. Um, Schneider Electric definitely knows that um, a two-man lift on a 120-pound inverter, you need to hang it on something solid, and we provide a, ver a very strong metal plate uh, that allows you to mount that. 
Once that's mounted and secured, that's when you actually start adding the rest of your balance of systems. The balance of systems um, is not rated to be part of the lift. and You don't want to rate, have it rated part of the lift uh, because it's already at 120 pounds uh, for the Connect uh, XW+. Plus. So getting it up on there and then mounting the rest of the balance of systems around it is the best way to do that. So the proper order is the bracket first, then hang the inverter, then add the balance of systems. So let's go ahead and look at what it takes to actually put the system together and what parts you're gonna to need to do that. So for the, let's start out with the XW Plus. Of course, we have the XW Plus, uh, the M Mini PDP, along with the COM box, which is what's gonna allow you to do that monitoring um, both locally as well as through uh, the Insight, and we'll talk about Insight in a little while. Uh, the battery monitor is definitely something to consider putting into the system, even on a float application, uh, which is what we're really talking about. Uh, this is going to allow you to understand exactly uh, your state of charge and make sure that the battery is being used properly. And then finally, that 100 amp load panel. When we talk about AC coupling, of course, you want to make sure that you understand how much power you're going to be fighting back through that panel, and you have an appropriately sized panel, not just for the loads, but if you're feeding back onto that panel, make sure that that panel is rated uh, for the proper amount of feedback as well. For the Connex SW, um, again, a, a very simple choice of products uh, with the SW itself. And then we have the DC switch gear, which is uh, going to have the DC uh, disconnect for the batteries, as well as the AC switch gear, uh, which is going to ha have the ability to actually add a second SW uh, without too much trouble or issues. And then finally, again, the comm box so that we can have that monitoring. And then finally, the battery monitor. And again, that 100 amp load panel, if we are doing AC coupling, make sure that you understand that you can only put so much onto that back feed. Uh, what you don't see in here, and I kind of put a little asterisk down here at the bottom, is, is that with the SCP, that's something that we want to make sure uh, we can have both local control. Uh, if for some reason the internet's down, you can't get that to work, uh, the SCP um, is a nice addition to the system, maybe slightly redundant, but definitely allows to do troubleshooting uh, if for some reason the uh, Wi-Fi connection is down, if you have a remote location, or for whatever reason you can't bring a, a laptop out there and talk to the, the comm box. So uh, this is really just uh, everything that you need to put it together. Um, I do like the, uh, the Mini PDP, which is a really nice product because it's going to have some of those products already wired inside of there, including the breakers as well as uh, some of the home runs between the XW Plus and the Mini PDP itself. For a case study, here's a really nice example of a system for that's set up for self-consumption. We have some Iron Edison batteries who provided this case study along with a pair of XW Pluses and four of the MPPT60 charge controllers along with the comm box. You can't quite see the comm box, but you can definitely see the uh, external power uh, supply there in the top center of the picture. So a really nice example of a system uh, up in Colorado that's uh, got about 12 kW of solar and uh, doing a nice job off setting uh, for a customer who didn't want to rely on the grid any longer. So the next little part we're going to be talking about is actually installing the inverters, uh, what it's needed. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that already with hanging uh, off of the uh, bracket and then mounting the rest of the equipment. So let's go ahead and get into exactly what's needed to install both the XW Plus along with the CSW and how it all goes together very, very nicely. For the Connext XW installation, we're going to be talking about the Mini PDP, although if you do plan on using more than one uh, XW Plus within an install, then you'll definitely want to check out the resources that we have available for the PDP. So let's go ahead and talk about how to hang that up on the wall and where to make those connections. So when we go to hang the XW Plus up on the wall, we want to make sure that uh, we have that mounted bracket on uh, some studs or that we have, say, three-quarter inch plywood up behind it uh, so that we can properly hang the 120 pounds. Of course, again, we want to make sure that anytime uh, we touch part of the system uh, that we're updating it to the latest NEC code compliance for your jurisdiction. Um, so again, Pretty simple. We're going to hang that uh, bracket up on the wall, make sure that we're hitting studs or that we have a supporting structure behind it. And then we're just going to get a two-man lift to pick that 120-pound inverter up and just simply hang it on those lips. And then we have some securing, some securing screws uh, to mount it there on the 
um, the wall once it's installed. Of course, then after that, uh, it's going to get pretty easy with attaching that uh, mini PDP and making those uh, connections as it comes partially pre-wired uh, from Schneider Electric. The thing that I really like about the mini PDP is just exactly how easy it is to put the system together. Uh, with the PDP, of course, it really does simplify that install. We make it pretty quick uh, because those pigtails that come from uh, the bus bars and the breakers go ahead and just land right up inside uh, the XW+. There's a couple keyhole slots that will match up and, and drive those screws into. Make sure that uh, first you've cleared the screws off, or the bolts I should say, off the bottom of the XW uh, before bringing that mini PDP up so that you can then replace those bolts and those will go through the positive and negative terminals. With the breakers, of, we have the uh, AC bypass, which is rated at 60 amps, both for the input and the output and uh, the DC is going to be a 250 amp uh, DC disconnect. So those internal conductors again the way the PDP ships is that it has those conductors already landed and ready to put up into the AC in and the AC out uh, ready to go and uh, we'll make sure that the bypass kit is in the proper position uh, so that if necessary we can flip that uh, switch and send the system into a bypass mode, which means that the inverter still has an AC input, but we're actually sending the AC around, so there's nothing on the AC output of that inverter, so we can work on it uh, without having any issues so let's look at the wiring that we have for the PDP itself. So you can see here on the left hand side that we have the rocker switch for the input output bypass uh, there. And you can see where those DC um, bus bars will actually mate up to the positive and negative there. The really nice thing with this uh, solution is, is that uh, to make those connections both external uh, from the AC side as well as the DC side, uh, you can just simply remove this DIN mount breaker set in the center here. It comes out and you can see that removed there in the right hand picture which makes getting in there and making those connections much, much easier uh, than some of the other uh, balance of systems uh, that exist out there on the market. So we really try to make this as easy as possible to put this together. Once the system is completely assembled um, and you have the dead front attached, there's a nice little bungee cord that actually allows you to put uh, documentation down behind the closed door. One of the nice thing to note is that uh, the door swings either direction. So once you get it on site and realize that maybe there's a better convenience for having that door swing out to the right instead of the left. Pretty easy switch uh, to move that swinging plate off the front uh, to the right or left hand side uh, for the door. So the Connext SW is a really nice product that, again, we try to make things as simple as possible uh, when talking about it. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the SW has, or Connext SW has to offer, um, both with the DC and AC switch gear, talk about some of the clearances, and uh, again, how easy it is to land those conductors uh, to finish that job up. So let's go ahead and talk about the, the dimensions and weights for the Connext SW. There's really kind of three main parts to this solution. We have the DC switch gear, which is uh, to the left of the Connext SW, uh, which we can see here has that little green plate. And then down below is the AC switch gear. The really nice thing is, is that if you decide that you want to bring in a second inverter, it makes it pretty easy uh, to stack a second uh, SW just above the first one. So definitely keep that in mind uh, when uh, deciding the dimensions for everything that you want to leave enough headroom so that if some point in the future you actually want to stack two of these together, you definitely can uh, without adding anything further on the AC side down below. Of course, uh, there is active cooling inside of the system, so make sure that you keep 10 inches clear to the right. With the AC and DC, along with the small signal connections, which just simply means the XAN bus as well as the battery temp sensor, uh, you can see here is, is quite clearly uh, displayed. You can definitely note the difference between the IEC 230 volt and the UL120 240. So we make those connections quite easy to do. Uh, you have access to that uh, system there with that little plate that gets removed on the left hand side of the inverter. So really think about that to get easy access to those, you'll probably want to put the DC um, box on second and definitely put the DC AC box on first so you can run those connectors and easily get at that and then bring your battery connectors in on the DC side. There's still plenty of room to move around inside uh, which is one of the things that we realize um, big hands and long elbows if you will. 
With the AC switch gear and setting up that wiring, uh, again, a very easy system because we do have the kit that is all DIN mount uh, for the AC inputs. And so you can choose uh, a single system or dual system setup. Uh, the other nice thing and something to note is that um, because there's up to nine slots there that can be added to the AC wiring box, you can very easily put that system together so that this actually is your critical load panel. And um, of course, the one thing to note is that you will have to create a small daisy chain bus uh, across the top to each one of those breakers uh, to bring it all together. And again, you can bring that um, that DIN mount breaker set out of the way so that you can run your conductors in. It just makes life so much easier uh, when putting this system together. So let's go ahead and look at monitoring. So we've got the system installed, we've done the right things to make sure that it's the right system for the job, but how do we make sure that that system's running well and uh, inappropriately? So the first things, of course, is not just monitoring, but actually setting that system up and programming. So let's go ahead and look at what that is and how you can do that with the Combox as well as the SCP. So programming and monitoring for the system, there's a few set points that we want to make sure that we're setting up correctly. Uh, in particular, we want to look at the battery manufacturer and make sure that we're putting in the C20 rate because there's a couple different calculations that are made within the uh, Schneider Electric product line based on that C20 rate. Uh, just because the number on the outside of the battery or the part number for that battery gives a number, double check to make sure that that is at the C20 rate uh, for that capacity. It could be the C100 um, or an arbitrary number. Of course, with that same spec sheet that we figured out what our C20 rate is, check to make sure that we're setting up the absorb and bulk voltage correctly. Along with that float voltage, uh, those are those voltages that um, are our charging set points for when we hit into a refloat or rebulk. The nice thing with the XW Plus, of course, is that we do ha do a end amps calculation. And what that means is, is that, uh, let's say we have a 1,000 amp hour battery bank and we want to end the charge when we know the batteries are full. And this is particularly important when we talk about AGM batteries or gel batteries. So when we get to 20 amps at uh, the absorbed voltage, we know that those batteries are full and we can actually end that, um, that charge a little bit sooner. And that's going to keep those batteries in a healthier state over the long term. Of course, when we're setting the system up, we have to make sure that we're enabling AC coupling uh, because the frequency shifting is going to begin at one and a half volts below that bulk setting. And so what's going to essentially occur is, is that um, as the voltage gets closer and closer to that bulk, it, the frequency is going to begin to shift. The one of two things is going to happen. Either the current's going to drop to a lower current setting uh, when we have a, a curtailing inverter. For a non-curtailing inverter, once we do hit that bulk voltage, then, then we know that that um, shift is going to occur all the way up to 60.5 hertz, which is going to become an unqualified source for that non-curtailing inverter, and it should turn off or stop uh, producing current for that system until it finds that qualified AC source again. If we don't enable AC coupling, what's going to happen is, is that uh, the inverter is going to continue providing 60.5 hertz and those batteries are going to start uh, rising in voltage to an unsafe level for those batteries and we risk damaging those batteries and possibly having the system turn off just simply because uh, the high battery cutout setting for the inverter is going to kick in and turn it off. Uh, for monitoring uh, with the Connex Com box, we kind of have two different ways that we can look at the system. Uh, Insight is that online system, which does require making sure you have the latest firmware installed so that you can set that uh, system up. And then for on site, the Connex uh, actually has, or the Connex Com box actually has a internal web page that does monitoring so we can see what that system's doing uh, both locally or if you have a VPN or port forwarding set up uh, you can actually uh, go see that system um, from an external site. So the basic setups using the COM box, we want to make sure that we absolutely have the latest firmware uh, downloaded. Head out to uh, solar.schneider-electric.com uh, to download that firmware. Uh, it does come with a thumb drive 
so that you can easily update that firmware. Um, and if you're going to be going out to a remote site, make sure that you've got that downloaded beforehand. Uh, you can use any thumb drive or bring a laptop with you. Make sure you have it with you if you don't uh, have an internet connection out there. Uh, again, with the com box, and the really nice thing is, is that we can make sure that we have the latest builds. So here's just a list as of um, July of 2016, or I'm sorry, June. <laughs> June of 2016, that's where we're at. Uh, you can uh, set that system up with these current firmware versions and uh, make sure that the system has the latest firmware inside of it for its best performance. For basic setups using the SCP, of course, I'm assuming here that we have the COM box, so you can also update the SCP uh, using the COM box to the latest firmware, which again, as of June, uh, it is 2.1 build 8. And this will give you uh, the latest uh, command and control and make sure that the system is absolutely up to date for all of your programming needs. So when we talk about setting up the system using not the COM box, but the SCP, of course, when it first boots up, you're going to go in and fill out how many amp hours the battery bank is, again, at that C20 rate, and go through and enable AC coupling. With the Connex XW's current uh, settings uh, capabilities, we can detect loads and indicate that we are AC coupling, as well as we want to make sure that we set up the max battery charge. Again, make sure that you're checking with the manufacturer. Uh, the XW Plus is a very powerful charger at 140 amps DC. If you have a smaller battery bank, you may find that um, the XW's charging capacity actually needs to be turned down a little bit, so they're not recharging the batteries too quickly. Uh, then after that, once we have the, the system set up, we can go in and go in and do the rest of the uh, settings for that system. For programming uh, for AC coupling with the SW, we want to make sure that uh, within the SCP that we're enabling SC cup or AC coupling and uh, we're setting that system up so it can detect loads. We also want to make sure, again, I can't reiterate this enough, that we're checking with the battery manufacturer to make sure that we are not charging that battery system too quickly. Again, uh, if you have questions about the AC coupling, uh, check out the white paper that's provided by Schneider Electric on following the steps for uh, further setup of that system and why we do some of these settings. But again, the most important part is enabling AC coupling within the advanced menu system. So we spent a lot of time talking about AC coupling, so we should definitely jump into just a few more details uh, when we're enabling that uh, system, either through the COM box or through the SCP. Essentially, when we look at the graphs there on the right-hand side, the top graph uh, shows basically, and this is available in the AC coupling white paper, uh, the, what occurs when we have a curtailing inverter. We really do get a three-stage charge out of that system uh, because we can vary the amount of current going into the batteries by sending a frequency change uh, up to 60.5 hertz. With a non-curtailing inverter and an IEEE 1541 inverter, what's going to happen is, is the inverter is going to uh, sense that there's a frequency change from the Schneider Electric, either the XW Plus or the Connext SW, and it's going to frequency shift up to 60.5 hertz, which then, of course, the IEEE 1541 says that is no longer a qualified source and will uh, end that charge and that's going to occur right at the bulk setting point and so the nice thing is is that we can get the inverters up to a bulk set point it's just not a perfect charge um, it doesn't mean that the system's not going to be compatible with it uh, but definitely means that uh, you may want to especially if you cycle the batteries a few times every once in a while put that uh, system into a forced bulk charge uh, through when we have a qualified AC source. We're not AC coupling, we're just connected to the grid or to a generator and do a good charge. And if you're cycling on a daily basis, definitely want to do a complete charge at least uh, once every five days to once a week. So monitoring is one of the things that um, is becoming an expectation in kind of the modern age of technology. We want to understand and know what that system is doing from really anywhere in the world. And there's a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, Connext Insight is obviously and probably one of the best ways to do it. So let's go ahead and go through and see how uh, monitoring can help make sure that that system's been installed and is running correctly.
So after the installation with that monitoring, there's really kind of two different ways that we can look at the system. Daily summary charts is gonna allow us to see how that system's performing on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the best things that we can do when we have monitoring is actually simulate a power outage and make sure that the system's actually working uh, the way we expected it. And just doing a one hour power outage may not be enough time, but simulating a 24 power outage uh, may be the best way to set that system up. It also ensures if the sun is shining uh, that we have the AC coupling set up and working correctly. So with the monitoring, we're able to see both the normal um, configuration of the system on a day-to-day -day basis, but as well, we can also check to make sure that during a power outage, either simulated or an actual power outage, uh, see how that system functioned uh, during that time. With monitoring after the installation, of course, we want to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And with the comm box, it makes it pretty darn easy to do it locally, um, as well as externally with Insight. So with the comm box locally, uh, we're able to send out email reports as well as make notes on what exactly is occurring on the meter side of things and note if there's an atypical production after we've done the install. Of course, we can see down in the second picture there, uh, we can see power flow within that system and make sure that everything's looking good. And uh, if we do have an event that occurs, we'll see that on the SCP. Uh, we'll also be able to look and see what that system's been doing. And if uh, there has been an issue, we can definitely dive into uh, what it is by looking at the historical data on that. And finally, with uh, practicing a power outage, of course, again, we absolutely need to make sure that that system's running up to uh, the expectations, both of the install and as of the customer. And so we can do that by practicing several power outages to see how power is consumed throughout that time. Don't just do it on a sunny day, uh, but definitely check out that system uh, when you have a partially sunny day to practice that power outage to make sure those critical loads are functioning and covered as expected. With Insight, we have the ability to not only monitor one system, but several systems. Here we have an example of several different systems throughout the United States. Of course, uh, we would zoom in a little bit closer if the installs were done in a more local scale. And that's the nice thing about the system is that we can monitor both a grid tie decentralized system uh, that Schneider Electric offers as well as battery base. And it's pretty easy to differentiate the two. We can see that in the square green box. It has a little battery symbol, which simply means that we have an off-grid or battery-based solution, whereas we just have the Connext Insight symbol. That means that that is a decentralized site. So it makes very easy to see that the system uh, or systems are running okay. Uh, we do notice that somewhere around between Tennessee and Mississippi, we have a system that is a different color. That's definitely one that we would want to investigate to see what is going on there and uh, why we have a uh, fault that's occurred. And we can dive into that system and again, use that monitoring uh, and history to be able to troubleshoot and figure out exactly what occurred there. So once we choose uh, a site, we can definitely dive in and see exactly what that site is doing. So from that general map that we just saw, you can simply click into the uh, kind of the next level and see exactly what that uh, particular system is doing. There's a lot of different uh, drop-down menus uh, there at the top or tabs that you can choose to see what the different systems are doing and graph out exactly uh, what you see here. Um, the other nice thing is, is that we can actually change those totals from daily totals, weekly, monthly, yearly, and of course the lifetime when we get into multiple years. So this makes seeing the system um, both as it's functioning as well as seeing what the, the graphing uh, which we're going to go into uh, will allow you to see as well. So the health the system at a glance or we can dive in even deeper and see uh, the overall life of that system um, or even just the day-to-day. -day. With the next tab we can see that we're looking at the actual solar production for the system uh, and then the second portion of that in the orange is the load output. So we're able to compare whether or not we're actually producing enough solar to, uh, to cover those loads just by looking at the daily graph and uh, apparently we are not uh, with this in this um, this graph. So on the blue part, we can see that the PV input, you know, throughout the evening is down to zero and it slowly starts to come up at 8 a.m. Um, and peaks out at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. We've got a significant dip at noon. 
the loads, of course, are being compared there in orange, and uh, they have loads as high as uh, looks like about 17 and a half uh, kilowatt hours uh, during that 10 o'clock time in the morning. And so with this slide, we can definitely look at in this tab, we can look at exactly how much we're producing compared to how much we're consuming. Um, in this comparison, we're definitely running a PV deficit uh, compared to loads, and this is really good information to make future decisions. Um, this could be uh, a place where if this is a consistent uh, production issue, then an alternate AC source may be needed, or this could have been a practice time uh, when we saw that the grid was down and uh, make sure that we actually have enough production plus uh, an AC source or just energy storage to make it through that period of time um, based on our sizing practices that we did, either 24-hour power outage um, or 48-hour power outage. That would help us look at and determine if we've used those batteries or if we've sized the batteries in the right way. So let's actually look at what the battery energy uh, tab does there uh, within Insight. Here we can see that we've got a system that we're able to compare both solar production and energy charge, meaning are we getting the batteries, um, how many kilowatt hours are we putting back into those batteries, as well as we can see that we have a generator here as well. So this is a great way of seeing, are we using those batteries properly? Are we actually getting a charge in there? And in this case, we're blending both PV as well as generator time uh, to cover the loads uh, within this system. So again, a great way to make sure that the batteries are being taken care of and that we're getting that proper charge into those batteries uh, without pulling too much energy out. Again, with Insight, we're able to see different parts of the system individually. And in this case, we're looking actually at what the generator energy that's produced each day uh, into the system. So we can see that we have across the top uh, the daily, weekly, monthly, um, all the way through yearly, and finally the lifetime energy produced by that system. This is an easy way, especially knowing the size of the generator and the loads. Um, how much uh, runtime we've had each day. So this makes actually being able to look at the system and address what the generator uh, is producing each day, which can give us a lot of information about uh, how well our PV is doing, how much energy consumption is being um, used throughout the day, and then finally, how long is the generator running each day, and does any maintenance cycles need to be addressed. And so when we finally look at the total life of the system and exactly what it's capable of doing, we can definitely start to understand that uh, we have a lot of information available through Connext Insight and how we can gather that information and use it in an appropriate way is so important uh, and is an expectation these days. And the Connext Insight does a really nice job of laying out the information exactly as you feel comfortable with the different series um, as well as choosing exactly how that data uh, get spread out with intervals, either daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, or over the lifetime of the system. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming to the webinar. It was a wonderful time, and uh, I appreciate uh, that you guys came to attend. So uh, a few things to kind of take away with you is that uh, the Connext Insight as well as the Combox really are the recommended way of taking care of monitoring your system. The internet is now so prolific throughout, um, especially North American homes, that uh, this is the way to bring that system in. But please don't forget that having an on-site tool like the SCP makes a lot of sense as well. And then of course, finally, just how easy it is to put together a system both for sizing as well as uh, just hanging that system up on the wall. If you do have any questions, please visit the Schneider uh, Electric website, and that's solar.schneider-electric.com. Uh, we look forward to having you at our future webinars, and again, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you.